Good afternoon. I'm Tom Byrne, president of the Korea Society. It's my pleasure to welcome all of our attendees to today's program, which covers an important and timely topic. The coronavirus pandemic is more than a public health crisis. Its implications weigh heavily on economics, politics, international relations, international institutions, and even international sporting events. How will the COVID-19 crisis change the international order? Today's discussion will provide analysis and insights that will shed light on domestic politics in both countries, bilateral relations between Seoul and Tokyo, and wider regional implications. We are proud to co-host this program with the Japan Society. This is our fifth joint policy program and the first joint program conducted with the Japan Society under the leadership of its new president, Dr. Joshua Walker, who moderates today's conversation. We look forward to a fruitful, fruitful partnership as we seek uh, to strengthen ties between the US and its key East Asian allies, Japan and the Republic of Korea. Panelists for today's sessions are the Council on Foreign Relations Senior Fellow for Japan Studies, Dr. Sheila Smith, and the Korea Society Senior Director for Policy Programs, Dr. Stephen Norper. I am looking forward to a rich discussion. Thank you, Tom. This is Joshua Walker with the Japan Society. Obviously, I'm not in the office like many of you because this coronavirus, which began uh, in Asia and actually Korea and Japan, uh, were the, some of the first democratic countries dealing with the problems that now we face ever more present here in New York. We're excited to be having this conversation across DC and New York. I'm really excited that Sheila Smith from the Council of Foreign Relations and Stephen Norper from uh, Columbia University right up the street are able to join us. I can't think of two better people. So let's jump right in. So uh, Sheila, let's start with you. Baseline, we've been tracking what's been going on in Japan. Obviously the decision on the Olympics has kind of put the spotlight even more on Japan. What's the current state of play of what's going on in Japan? We just saw this week a national emergency, but national emergencies are a bit different there than here. Can you unpack this for us? What's going on in Japan? What has been going on? What's our baseline today? Sure, and thank you, Joshua and Tom, for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here with Steve. It's a great time to have this conversation. So a couple of basic things. I wrote a blog piece on CFR.org on, on Monday. If you want the details, you can see some of it there. But I think you know it's, it's important to remember we're at the three-month mark, pretty much, right? January, February, March. And in the J Japanese case, you went from four cases in January, and then that concentration on the Diamond Princess cruise ship in February, a small cluster outbreak up in Hawaii. Kaido. And then in March, you started to see a much, much broader community transmission that prompted the Japanese government, both medical experts and the advisory team, the cabinet officials that Prime Minister Abe had put together, the task force, both sides, uh, medical, public health officials and uh, political leaders decided that the cluster strategy was not working. So that's what the national emergency uh, that was declared. It came out of a diet conversation, a new law was passed. Up until mid-March, they were still working off an, an old law that was written to deal with ill, with inflow, with influenza, with influenza, previous pandemics, right? It was informed by both SARS and H1N1. So the new law gave the, uh, the government, the national government, far greater uh, authorities. And it allowed them to do things like mobilize the self-defense forces, to be able to mobilize national resources for prefectural in other words, local uh, needs, and to direct attention to the areas in which, especially the urban areas in which um, the, the government was getting increasingly concerned about community transmission. There were six prefectures uh, at the start. Um, that was Tokyo. So the Tokyo Metropolitan Government was affected here. Tokyo, Saitama, Kanagawa, and Chiba. So those last three being sort of the communities around metropolitan Tokyo. And then Osaka, and its uh, suburb, if you will, Hyogo Prefecture, and then Fukuoka. Uh, today, I saw that um, uh, Kyoto has asked to join that group because it is now seeing increasing spread within its city limits as well. So the law gives the national government an ability to focus attention on these urban centers to designate who is in the state of emergency. What it doesn't do, though, is equally important. It cannot compel Japanese citizens to stay at home. We're still in the world of persuasion here for Japan. Um, it gives a little bit more moral authority. It gives a little bit more push 
uh, between the Japanese state and the citizen. But where it doesn't, what it can't do is it can't tell Japanese corporations, they can't enforce teleworking, for example. So it can't change private sector behavior to the full extent um, that you might see in other, other countries who've had to deal with this. And it does nothing for local authority. So Governor Koike, right, in uh, Tokyo does not have the authority to compel her residents to stay home. A um, Couple of things on the Japanese case. Um, we, we're so focused on the public health dimensions of this as we should be. Um, I'm not an epi epidemiologist, so I can't judge the what is a good strategy and a bad strategy, whether it was late or early, right? Uh, so I'm gonna leave that for much, much later and for the analysts and experts who can talk to that. But there were other bigger factors here that also played in, in addition to the public, how do you manage COVID-19? Um, the first of course was, um, that the Japanese government, you know, much like us, allowed their medical health experts to lead. Um, we did not later in the process. It became a much more political process here in the United States. Um, and I'm sure Steve will help us understand uh, the, the dynamic between those that medical expertise and political leadership in South Korea. The other was, of course, the Diamond Princess, right? That was not anybody's expectation, um, but but Japan allowed the Diamond Princess uh, to dock in Yokohama after some uh, one passenger had been confirmed on February 1st as, as positive for COVID-19, managing the 3,700 passengers then on that ship was very complicated and, and, and the Abe cabinet got pretty harsh criticism for some of its decision-making there. There's also the complex relationship with China um, so much of the supply chain relationship between Japanese manufacturers involves Hebei province, in other words, with the, with the capital, which is Wuhan. So not just Hebei province, but beyond that, but especially in the area where it was badly uh, affected, the lockdown was imposed, had a tremendous impact on Japanese manufacturers. And finally, the economic picture in Japan was really not very positive, right? Coming out of 2019, and as you mentioned, the Olympics were seen as a great boost to Japanese, a fairly sluggish Japanese economy, but also is going to be this kind of, um, you know, uh, exit uh, exit strategy for Abenomics, right? For coming out of the, the tenure of Prime Minister Abe. So there's been a lot of dimensions here in the Japanese decision-making beyond the public health piece that, that have affected the way in which the, the Japanese response evolved. Thank you, Sheila. There's a lot in there I can't wait to unpack. But before I do that, let me turn to Stephen and kind of what's the picture look like in Korea? Uh, similarities, differences from what we just heard from Japan and also what we're experiencing right here in the US. Well, uh, to begin with, Korea, too, was prepared uh, better than some relative to the fact that they'd gone through SARS and uh, H1N1, as Sheila pointed out, for Japan. Uh, and the Korean CDC had done a December exercise uh, projecting on a pandemic. So there was a readiness within some of the technical and scientific community. The political uh, community lagged a bit in the sense that it really wasn't until early February and the blow up around the cluster in Daegu that uh, led the Korean government to mobilize. It was explained away at first and the president uh, took a hit in the polls as a result of that when there was a sentiment that perhaps this wasn't going to be what it turned into. Uh, but that said, Korea has been very fast then on the uptick. And really, it's had a three-pronged approach. You know, its flexibility and technology have been key uh, to mass testing, uh, which it has done par excellence. Uh, over a half a million citizens uh, tested the contact tracing Innovative, use, innovative uses of new technology to track contacts, as well as uh, in treatment and testing and aggressive social distancing. Korea's had a very active policy. Uh, Korea now has uh, this week, as of today, uh, 27 new cases. Uh, it's good, it seems to have leveled out, unlike what's happening in Japan, where we're at a spike now as cases are increasing. It makes Japan similar in some ways to the realities in the United States and Europe, as uh, seen its, its peak later. Uh, Korea has leveled, and that's the lowest since late February for Korea. Uh, 10,450 cases. Uh, a rise today to 211 fatalities. But important that Daegu today reported zero cases for a first time since late February. Uh, 7,000 Koreans have recovered. 
uh, and again, over half a million tested. So 150 nations plus now have reached out to Korea. Uh, Korea has exported close to $50 million in test kits and uh, that from 27 Korean firms. So a lot of uh, people are turning to Korea for uh, the test kits and the supplies, as well as for the expertise and a public policy level in how to address this. And perhaps it all comes down to today with the start of early elections. Next Wednesday is the official uh, start of parliamentary elections. But today, early election testing started. Uh, why? One was to create social distancing. And those have been done in a model way, sanitation, uh, distancing at the polling place, uh, and perhaps a model program for other countries and, and municipalities looking at how to handle elections in the COVID era. Uh, but uh, we can talk more about the election realities and, and the domestic political impact. Uh, but uh, Korea then has seen some similarities to Japan, uh, but is further along on that curve and that curve has flattened, which is important to remember. Thank you. So picking up right where you left off, Stephen, let me just ask you a quick question about the elections, given that it's mm -hmm. right there uh, happening next week. Um, we saw what happened in this country in Wisconsin, and it was a bit of a disaster. And part of this is, is related mm -hmm. to the national, federal versus the state. Uh, in the U.S. system, President Trump uh, can declare a national emergency, but it's really the governors. And that's very different than what Sheila described in Japan. So I'm going to ask her about that in a second. But I want to come to you. You just said that uh, Korea seems to have a model uh, representation in terms of being able to go forward. Is COVID going to affect uh, the president, uh, the, not the president, so the elections? It, Korea next week and what lessons can we learn if, if there are any there? Yeah, it, it is already affecting it pretty dramatically. Uh, one, as I've mentioned in terms of the, the actual execution of, of the election, how to hold an election, how to create sanitary conditions. And for those who show up with a temperature above 97.5, uh, they are then cordoned off into a separate area for voting and then taken for testing. So there's a lot of precaution uh, but really, it also comes down in a political sense to what's happened to President Moon Jae-in. His popularity has gone up. Uh, he's at about 52 or 53 percent. That's about the approval rating he's receiving for the handling of the crisis versus about 43 uh, percent who, who disfavor the approach. And uh, there has been really for the elections, uh, the issue coming down to whether people approve of the handling of COVID uh, or disapprove of it. So whereas uh, earlier in the year, when one was looking ahead to the national elections, it was domestic economic issues, uh, uh, things like uh, fiscal policy easing or or, uh, creating a minimum wage. Uh, some people thought it would be a referendum on South Korea's North Korea policy. Uh, but now it's really coronavirus only. And how is the government handling that? And so that appears then to cre have created a, a bump up for the ruling party. And uh, with 300 seats uh, at contest, uh, 253 get voted directly, uh, another 47 get decided by party. It will be interesting to see whether or not the president uh, walks away with a majority in the National Assembly, mm -hmm. and then how the sole election is handled as well, because the two leading candidates for the uh, main party and for the opposition may well be the 2022 presidential candidates. Great. So that leads nicely into what I was going to ask Sheila about. <laughs> you, you talked about the diamond yeah. princess and kind of the the real kind of unprecedented nature of this. And at the time you said they took a lot of heat. Now we've had a lot of these similar cruise ships dealing off the coast of San Francisco, Oakland, et cetera. Um, it was interesting at that moment, I obviously grew up in Hokkaido. So what happened in Hokkaido and Governor Suzuki and his yeah. leadership there, Governor Koike in Tokyo, you mentioned Kanagawa governor, we're not used to hearing about governors in Japan because it's really at the national level, but we saw a lot of leadership coming from there. Uh, is that going to have domestic implications, not just on the local level, but you also mentioned the diet. Uh, is this going to be playing out in Japanese politics? Uh, you know, obviously there's an election in July in Tokyo. How does this all impact Japanese domestic politics in the way we just heard about Korea? All right, lots of questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, let me let me let me backtrack, Josh, before I hit your questions because I forgot to give you the numbers. You asked me about the numbers, and it struck when Steve was talking about Korea's numbers how Japan is still behind in terms of the absolute number of cases. So the Ministry of Health and uh, Welfare today, Health, Labor, and Welfare today, said that there are five thousand three hundred and forty-seven cases in Japan. So still a number smaller. Uh, certainly much, much smaller than what we see in Europe and what you see here in the United States. Um, Tokyo of that though, 32% are in Tokyo. So about 1700 of those cases are concentrated in Tokyo. Um, I, I think um, 
the first piece of the politi- the, the local government, that balancing act between local and national is interesting, Josh. I think it was, you know, we saw actually local governors, local officials come to the fore uh, in 2011 in the Great East Japan earthquake. As you'll remember, a lot of the local capacity, especially municipal capacity, was devastated then by the earth- by the tsunami and uh, earthquake. Um, but you had local leaders, not only elected leaders, but also nonprofit you know, citizens of the, the community also stand up um, at the local level. But what I thought was interesting, you mentioned Hokkaido and Governor Suzuki is, um, and I, I pointed this out in the blog, is he didn't wait for the national government to tell him what to do. He's a fairly young dynamic leader, but he immediately just hit the pause button and said, people go home and got a lot of flack because of course, February is, is t- tourist season in Sapporo, right? It's ski season. You've got lots of foreign and domestic uh, tourists in his region. So the restaurants and other businesses downtown Sapporo were not happy with him, but complied. Um, but he had no legal authority to impose it. And I think that's the interesting thing um, about the Japanese case. And I don't know, Steve, if you want to talk a, a contrast with Korea, but but this is still a persuasion, not a compellence story. There's no legal compellence either at the na- national government has more latitude but the local governors really can't make people do things. Um, but you are seeing people you know, stand up and Governor Koike in Tokyo, of course, uh, was due to come to the United States. She was gonna give a speech uh, at CFR, but uh, she canceled it in the early stages of the COVID-19 outbreak. She felt she needed to be home. Uh, her government has been working very hard on the what ifs of community transmission in Tokyo, uh, and especially on issues of capacity, you know, medical capacity, beds, uh, ICUs, ventilators, those kinds of things where Tokyo is actually struggling, surprisingly. It's not for lack of sophisticated medical access, but in terms of capacity, some of Japan's urban centers have been falling behind. But I think what you see in Koike is a little bit the public perception that she's playing a little bit of a catch up game to the numbers. Whereas with Governor Suzuki, he looked like he was out ahead. Um, and so that per- perceptions, whether it's true or not, those perceptions really do matter. And so I think that contrast is interesting. Um, the election piece, I think well, I was looking more at the general election. I think all of us were expecting after a successful Olympics, or at least the political com- you know, commentariat in Tokyo were expecting that there would be a general election. The LDP that would win with Abe still at the helm, and then there would be a transition of party leaders. Uh, at that point. And I think most people thought it was probably coming in the fall of 2020. Now the Tokyo election, I think it's just gonna be, it's a who knows kind of answer to your question about that because I I just think, there's just too many variables between now and then, right? Um, And I think with the postponement of the Olympics, it may in fact obviously also affect that timing. It could affect that timing as well, I don't know. The last piece, and um, again, prompted by Steve's um, uh, com- uh, pointing out that the approval rating um, has changed, that the approval rating, right, for President Moon has shifted. Um, I think there's an interesting poll that just came out this morning by Kyodo News. Again, it's one data point, one poll. It's not the, the, the be all and end all, but Abe is a little bit in trouble with public perceptions. I think 82% of respondents were very worried about their government's handling of COVID-19. Um, and the other is, you know, Abe's had a few bumps in his eight years or so of being in office. He's had scandals where his, he's passed legislation where his public support rating or approval rating has come down quickly. Uh, but this is today, this poll suggests it's the biggest drop in public uh, support or public approval in two years for him. And it dropped by 8%, but he's still at 41%. And that's, you know, again, we always have to put this in context with Prime Minister Abe. He has a re- remarkably steady uh, public approval rating in Japan. Great, thank you, Stephen. Let me turn to you to kind of uh, talk a little bit about the comparison on the domestic side, but then I also want to open the aperture up a little bit and talk about the regional dynamics. I think one of the things as I started at the beginning, uh, you know, at Japan Society, we've been tracking this for a while when people had not even heard of this virus, probably like Korea Society, because we were watching this having an effect starting in February, and now it's come full force here in New York and across the U.S., um, but it really has emphasized the switch 
from a kind of a transatlantic to a trans-Pacific space where Asia really is out in the front. All the good stories we hear about tend to be in the Asian case and Korea and Japan are certainly leaders along with Taiwan and others, uh, but it really has kind of put a pretty negative light on the European side of things and sometimes even the American response. So uh, as you talk about the domestic implications, if you can kind of take that to the regional context, you know, traditionally, uh, right before COVID, if we were talking about Korea and Japan, it might be in a more negative security context. Now with the public health impediment, uh, we're all in this together and Korea, particularly on the testing side, Japan in terms of using its technology and cluster side, there is kind of a Korean and Japanese way that's developing uh, that could potentially offer a way forward. So I'm curious about the regional implications of this. Yeah, those, those are huge. And, and I'm glad that you're emphasizing, Josh, the, the commonality and the common response that we know is going to have to take place. And really, you're right to say all eyes are on Asia because it will be given the, the trend lines, the first area to get out. So as Asia gets out, uh, as it deals with second or third waves, uh, as it tries to restructure economically, uh, the rest of the world will be watching and, and certainly Europe and North America will be taking a lot of its lead from that uh, as it's dealing with the, the fallout from their own pandemics. Uh, what we have to be re remember too is as they're looking at places like Korea uh, for the expertise uh, by way of mass testing, by way of the contact tracing, uh, by way of the aggressive social distancing, uh, for the equipment and supplies and the test kits. Uh, there are also trends uh, of which to be wary. One today that the Korean CDC has been struggling with, and it started earlier this week, is uh, the reactivation or the relapse of certain cases. And they're concerned the number today is up to 91. And they're trying to figure out what exactly that is. So again, as this happens and as the science leads us forward, uh, you know, it will be the, the virus that decides. And, and uh, to jump then into the regional, I, I guess my first thought picking up from what you've just said and where Sheila left off on Olympics is, uh, uh, look, this is a huge blow for Abe in terms of the Olympics. In April too, he was supposed to have a meeting with Xi. Uh, there was a lot of political capital in both clearly, but uh, the move to July, 2021, uh, is something really important for the region. There's been a lot of talk, you know, should the Olympic flame, which has been sequestered now, uh, be put in some sort of global tour as a, a sign uh, during the pandemic of, of a hopeful thing. And clearly the games will have an added importance uh, uh, if they occur in July 2021. 20, uh, uh, important to note that today the CEO of the Japan Olympic Committee uh, urged caution saying really, uh, we're gonna have to see where we are in 16 months time. Uh, and to that end, again, the science leads the way. It's the vaccine that we're, will be essential uh, to have out and to have uh, implemented by that time. Uh, I think other aspects of the bilateral relationship and the regional dynamic are that we're gonna need an economic easing. Uh, you know, Abe was already looking at the prospects of a recession, uh, the economic downturn in both Japan and Korea. So even if Moon does well, there will be heavy demands for uh, increased in economic accountability. Uh, means that there'll have to be better economic cooperation between the two. So it will turn the tide perhaps of, of where they were going by way of the difficulties of the last two years. So there'll need to be an easing of export controls. There'll need to be a relisting for preferential uh, trade uh, preferences. Uh, you know, it was mentioned that the, the China and the supply chain uh, is an issue. So there will probably be a need to revisit that and probably closer supply chain linkages between Japan and Korea, uh, but also as China reintegrates into that, there's going to be diversification uh, around the region to try to come up with a better system. There will also be a certain level of inward preparation as stockpiles on medicines, stockpiles on energy, uh, become priorities for these different countries. So there'll be a pull and a push between the global solution and, and nationalisms. And we have to be careful about the flare up of, of nationalist sentiments uh, on, the, on the out uh, pace of this thing. Uh, also the common health agenda, that may be obvious, but the common response, both Japan and Korea have 
uh, grain populations, aging populations. Uh, both have leading medical sectors, so the cooperation on diagnostics and how they're addressing a second or third stage. Uh, and then lastly, I'll just mention by way of regional, we still have the continuing security concerns with North Korea, and those have been defined by way of missiles and nuke, human rights and other concerns we have. But in the event of a massive outbreak of coronavirus within North Korea, which does not have a very viable public health sector, that could ostensibly create a challenge for both South Korea and Japan. So the lesson is you, uh, in part, is one for cooperation, uh, coordination, uh, among, as Tom Bird mentioned, the critical allies, Korea, Japan, and the United States. Thank you, Stephen. You, you put a lot out there, and I want to just pick up where you left off and turn over to Sheila. But just to put this in a broader context, Sheila, you literally have written a book on China and Japan. Uh, so it would be kind of remiss if I didn't simply ask the role, because all of this happens against the backdrop of a U.S.-China competition and kind of the, the, the Chinese virus, Wuhan virus, G7 type of uh, uh, rubric that this, is, this has had, you know, as, as Stephen left off. Korea and Japan as U.S. allies have never been more critical in terms of being frontline states, not just uh, against China, but now against this virus. And so I guess the question is, how do you see this? Uh, you know, you're in D.C., so I think a lot of folks in D.C. tend to look at everything through a particularly security heavy vision. Um, is that the right lens to be looking at this or how do you think about the, the broader dynamics of this playing out? So thanks, Josh. I think, you know, I because I live in D.C., I kind of push back a little bit on, the, on this idea that everything is about the U.S.-China strategic competition. It doesn't mean that there isn't one. There is. And there's plenty for us to think about. But in the context of COVID-19, I don't, I, I, as you said, I don't see this as the right lens. I think the framework here is opportunity. And precisely because pandemics and other kinds of human security concerns. We've all seen them, whether they're nat natural disasters or they're um, the, the current situation we're in. I, you know, we can't fix it by ourselves. It's just not possible. And I think what I worry about is uh, a little bit the weakening of global institutions. I watch the, the spitting in this, uh, uh, over the WHO and, and you know, fear about being able to talk about China without getting retribution because of Chinese contributions and things like that. But I think the problem is not necessarily the US-China dynamic. I think what we're seeing here is a pulling back from this idea of shared solutions, that shared solutions in and of themselves have a value. And I can see, you, we, we've seen this, and Steve and I have talked about this publicly on, on several occasions over the last couple of years, right? Clearly this is eroded in the bilateral Japan-Korea relationship. I hope that this is an opportunity for getting back to this idea that there's so much more in common and the strengths of both can really contribute to the region much more successfully than competition between both sides. So there's a lot here, I think, for Seoul and Tokyo to think about um, to, to help that relationship. On the China piece, um, here, you know, the aging society uh, conundrum that Steve mentioned, uh, it's not just South Korea, but China has this problem as well. And, what else can, what a, what a good way for the three countries of Northeast Asia to come together to think about the population and community that is most affected by COVID-19. Um, and it must now, I think, pandemic management in an aging society, I think is a new area of policy formulation, but also med medical knowledge and research as well as social policy development. So there's three countries here with an aging society that I think can, can really bring a lot to the table as we merge these two issues. Where I think it's gonna to be tough though, is it's going to be tough in the economic realm. And I think it's gotten a lot of headlines, but after the national emergency was announced by Prime Minister Abe, um, the stimulus package was a $1 trillion stimulus was announced by the Japanese government. And what captured everybody's attention is of course, lots of loans for small businesses, lots of in inducements for teleworking, for changing, um, and lots of households, you know, a, a, a relaxation of taxation and things like that. But, 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 but the big, the big draw here was the, the, I forget how much it was. It was um, $2 billion, so 220 billion yen was incentive for, for companies abroad to, in China to relocate back to Japan. And that's a big chunk of money. Now it's, it's following on the tail of private sector decision-making already. So in February, you saw somewhere around 37% of the 2,600 companies that were invested in, were in China were seeking to diversify 
And so you've already got some research that suggests that the COVID-19 began this process. But offering, starkly, offering $2 billion in incentive or subsidies for companies that wish to relocate back to Japan uh, is a pretty uh, amazing statement about the future of the economic relationship between Japan and China. I suspect it's not just Japan and China, it will be us and China, it will probably be South Korea and China, but I think you are going to see this, this trend line of diversification. It's a very tough balancing act for Prime Minister Abe or the, his successor to manage, because as you know, uh, Japan relies heavily on China's economy for its own economic growth. Um, the tourism sector, huge impact already. And, and, and that's going to continue if you find that the, um, the outcome of this COVID-19 is to, to convince people they really shouldn't go abroad. They shouldn't travel. Um, I think nor in Northeast Asia, but broadly across Asia, Asian um, citizens have been much, much more on the uptick of the global tourism wave because they're, they're wealthier. They don't see a world that's dangerous out there, right? They've enjoyed the travel and the and expansion of tourism opportunities in the region and beyond. But this could change a lot of that, which means that consumers will be spending their money in different places. And that too has pretty uh, intense implications for Japan. Great, thank you. Now I do want to prepare our audience that we will be coming to your questions. And so make sure you get those questions in. Uh, but before we do, I, I want to give Stephen a chance to both respond, but also to unpack uh, something that he, he kind of picked up and then Sheila just ran with, the idea of kind of nationalism uh, and populism in this environment and how that could play out. Because on the one hand, COVID really uh, accentuates the fact that where you live and where it comes from, if the virus is coming from outside. And there is a commonality here. A lot of countries are beginning to take that rhetoric and say, well, it's from out there. If everyone just stays in and we lock the people from outside in, it does create an opportunity for pol politicians to take advantage of that, not just uh, in Korea and Japan, but frankly here in the United States as well. So I just wanted you to unpack how that could uh, play out in a broader uh, global sense, but particularly with focus on the Korean elections and more broadly the impact this might have in a post-COVID world uh, for a, a Korean a president and kind of leaders there. And then I'll come to Sheila uh, and I'm gonna try to end with an optimistic tone uh, rather than a more <laughs> pessimistic what this might lead us to. Sure. Well, you know, between that comment, Josh, and your introduction where you mentioned the fact that they're democracies, uh, look, that's one aspect of Korea and Japan uh, in commonality uh, that translates into heavy accountability on the part of the government, and that will translate at the polling place. So we'll see how the National Assembly elections play out, whether or not Moon uh, gets more of a mandate by way of the National Assembly, how things are disposed uh, leading into his final two years and leading up to the 2022 elections. Uh, but it will be a, a cautious place. Already Korea has dealt with recent years of significant political divisiveness. And so we'll see uh, how the response goes and where uh, public favorability is uh, in relations to that. And some of it, again, will be virus driven. If there are second and third waves of this, does it create new challenges for government and government responses? Right now, we've had in Korea, uh, at least since February, a fairly tight governmental response, the national and the prefectural and municipal levels working very closely. Uh, but there's no reason to think that we're not going to continue to keep getting better uh, with the diagnostics and that the flexibility and the innovative nature we've seen in the Korean response, the drive through testing, et cetera, won't continue to be refined. Uh, the test results being given very rapidly uh, via cell phone. I think those will become international standards over time. Uh, in terms of uh, the China question, I just wanted to add uh, my support for Sheila's uh, cautionary that we not let U.S.-China relations and difficulties in that bilateral relationship uh, kind of cloud where we are in terms of the realities of Northeast Asia. Uh, while China may have had a, uh, a stricter response and an ability to impose measures uh, that, that might be a less translatable in the democratic systems like Korea or Japan, the response and the coming out of it and the economic interdependencies are such that there really will be a Northeast Asia response.
response. As much attention as we focused on the Olympics, uh, Pyeongchang 2018, Tokyo 2020 into 2021, Beijing 2022. Uh, now we have a whole other dynamic where we can be talking about potential friction or what we hope for, which is cooperation. And uh, certainly the health sectors will lead us forward in terms of their abilities, such talented sectors across the board in Korea, Japan, and China. Uh, but we need transparency that has been a hallmark of what we've seen in Korea, right? All of this information is put out there. That is an interesting contrast to say something like the technology, the tracing or monitoring associated with things like counterterrorism, which are closed. This is very open. So again, the open transparency that, that facilitates that should, should create an easing and hopefully uh, a positive bump and one that the, the political leaders can work with in new and creative ways. And the social responsibility among the citizenry. A lot of Japanese citizens were already taking personal lead on this without a government mandate. And uh, clearly Korean civil society is such an active component. Uh, they too have been driving the uh, national response as much as leadership has been determining and it's required a lot of cooperation, uh, both in terms of social distancing, the stay at home orders, et cetera. Uh, to, to kind of look further and just to put a cap on it then on the regional aspect is as we try to strike a, a way out, right? As China seems to be emerging, as the lights are going back on and things are becoming more active, you know, what will be that receptivity on travel, on tourism, uh, and how will things open up? And, and it's yet to be seen whether there will be more national uh, impulses, nationalisms, uh, and nationalistic tendencies, or, or whether we see really a, a bridging to try to establish a common response. But certainly those of us associated with the societies and I think joining us online today are, are most keen on seeing how that plays out. Great, thank you. Sheila, let me, let me turn it to you and let me just pick up on a thread of something you said and kind of ask, uh, for a response to that, but also with whatever you want to kind of frame before we go to these questions. Uh, you mentioned the idea that the, the, the great East Asian earthquake of 311 really changed domestic Japanese politics. The, the, you know, the reason the LDP is so uh, in charge now, the reason Prime Minister Abe has become the longest serving prime minister, in many ways, its roots go back to the response of 211 and how many of the, the leaders at the time were not those that we would have expected. It wasn't the prime minister or TEPCO, the major power company that stood up, if anything, they, they, they uh, were, were held accountable, as Stephen talked about, in democracies. Um, do you expect a similar type of response in a post-COVID world? We've already been talking about what comes next after Abe, so I don't really want to ask you to pontificate on a post-Abe world, because that might be like a post-COVID world. It's hard to know. But what uh, kind of opportunities do you see moving forward for Japan's global role uh, in some of the same veins of what Stephen offered before we turn it open to broader questions? Sure. I think all national leaders are under a microscope, right? And so the relationship between political leaders and the medical experts, right, that have both the data and analysis and experience to guide public policy making at this particular moment, that relationship is really going to save the day. And I think a lot of, in a lot of ways, in a lot of countries. But as I think going back to something Steve said earlier, I think the virus is going to lead much of this, right? And until we get the an analytical capacity to know how to stem and contain it, we're still going to be at this testing, you know, try this, try that. What are the best practices? What did South Korea do? What, what's Japan doing now? We're looking for best practices. The, 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 the international community, and this is implicit in all of our comments, but it needs probably to be stated clearly, the international community is also that medical community. It is the medical experts, it is the scientists, it's the people that will help us with a whole host and array of human security issues, right? And so we get very focused on the, politically, the, the political representatives, Abe, Trump, Moon, right? Um, but we forget there is international cooperation has many, you know, sort of communities that support the idea right? That we're going to be able to find solutions to these kind of global challenges together. And I think that's where I would, I would hope, whether it's private sector or it's in international organizations like the WHO, or whether it's the bi-national or tri or 
quad, whatever the formulation is. Um, I think that we have many, many ways in which we can see in this COVID-19 that the infrastructure of decision-making on the, around the globe is weakened, I think, by not strengthening our global response or the basic premise that our response ought to be global, right? So that worries me both at the WHO level, I think our scientists and our medical community has actually done a much, much better job of leading. And so I see Chinese scientists and American scientists and Korean scientists all exchanging data and best practices. I think what's interesting here, and this is, I'm gonna take us to the United States for just a second, is our governors, I live in Maryland, my governor, Governor Hogan, often cite South Korean example or Singapore example or Taiwan example or what worked, you know. So they are looking for best practices, right? In international experience that has predated the American experience. And I think that's a great thing actually. So I think there's an awful lot of latitude there for those kinds of local leaders, people who have the authority to respond beyond the national, right? Yeah, governments, governance infrastructure. But I think, you know, back Josh, I know you wanna end on an optimistic note. And I, I think, and, and I will, I promise you I will, but I think there's an awful lot of fear here about the pulling back, the acceleration of what trends that we've already begun to see about, you know, in Europe, right? That the European project is weaker, now, you can see coming out of Italy, lots of commentary about how they feel the EU let them down, right? So accelerating a conversation that may not have been nationalist in the same way that we're using the word. Um, but I think you're, what we're going to have to see here is active efforts. And here's where I think Japan and South Korea have an opportunity to be advocates for not allowing that to, to, take, to be the dominant narrative. And I think it's going to take an awful lot of hard work. But I think the experience of the countries of Asia give it a great platform for saying, we are not convinced that this is a moment to pull back. We are convinced that best, uh, sharing best practices, sharing scientific knowledge, sharing our mistakes in a transparent way is the best thing we can do for the next pandemic, for the next crisis that we all know we're going to face. So I would like to see President Moon and whoever succeeds him and Prime Minister Abe and whoever exceeds, succeeds him see their job in that way because it's not gonna come, I'm afraid to say, at least I don't think so. In the short term, it's not going to come from Washington. In the longer term, maybe we can be more hopeful that Washington will play a much more uh, stronger role in that. But I do think there's an awful lot of latitude for the countries uh, of Asia and particularly the two countries we're talking about today to get out in front of the global kind of community building, I think that needs to be much, much more strongly sustained. I'm gonna to turn to our uh, uh, kind of uh, technical folks who've done a great job at the Korea Society and Japan Society to bring questions. But before we do that, let me just put a small footnote along with my thanks to Sheila and Stephen for this great conversation that we're gonna continue with your questions. Um, it does strike picking up on the theme you guys have talked about of kind of the way we learn, uh, even the language about fighting the next battle doesn't seem to fit us very well in a public health environment. And I just have to say that the Japan Society, the last time we had to close our door uh, was World War II. So it really emphasizes the gravity of the situation and how there really is a global order that is shifting. But there's an opportunity here for all of us as individuals, all of us as societies to step into that. And one hopeful story I just wanna share uh, with you all uh, is I was recently talking with some folks who do work with us, uh, who basically had a bunch of doctors that came after 311 to learn some of the best practices here in New York uh, from 9-11. And they now are back in Japan. And as they've watched this pandemic sweep New York City, where we've become the epicenter, Center, they wanted to do something. And so they came together and they asked their hospital to send equipment over to, uh, to, to New York. And of course, the hospital said, we're in the middle of a second wave. It's not appropriate for us as an institution. But the doctors said, well, we want to do this on our own. And they were able to actually bring all of their efforts together. And they're working with the Japanese Medical Association uh, to send that support to New York. So I think there's going to be this moment, whether it's the Olympics or others, where we're, we can celebrate where we were and the resiliency of coming out of the stronger together. So with that, let me simply <coughs> We thank you all and our viewers and then turn it over uh, to our moderators on the other end who've been taking all your uh, fabulous questions. I understand we have a lot. So please let me get those questions for our great panelists, Sheila and Stephen, with my great thanks. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, so it's going to be my role as the facilitator of your questions to pass along 
uh, our questions from the audience, and we've gotten lots of interest um, from all corners of the globe and all different sectors Great. of society. So very excited to pass those along. Um, we do also have a lot of positive feedback from our YouTube watchers as well. So I'm gonna join them in thanking our panelists today for such a great discussion. Without further ado, I'll get into the first question, which comes to us uh, both from Jerry Mullaney. He, he is an international news editor for the New York Times and Asia headquarters in Hong Kong and Charlie Kimball from the Korea Center for International Finance. And they wanna just dig down a little bit deeper into the election. Has President Moon gained standing domestically because of South Korea's handling of the virus and the praise it has received? So I guess, uh, Stephen, if you could just unpack that a little further for us. Sure, sure. Well, your reference to the New York Times is good and that Chae Sung-hun today has a very good piece out about the early start on the uh, parliamentary elections. And uh, he's a very good reader of the tea leaves. So I think that's a highly accurate article and uh, its analysis. Um, it seems that the there's an economist economist piece out uh, actually in two days time, but it's circulating online already uh, that goes ahead and, and breaks down where the party disposition was leading into this. And that was essentially that there was about 43 percent for the ruling party, for the Demo uh, Democrats and un for the United Future, for the opposition, about 21 percent. Uh, the differential then is played out against the uh, 27 smaller parties. There's a heavy smaller party aspect to this National Assembly election. And the hope is uh, on the part of the ruling party that they will then align these, these smaller parties and, the, and their winners will align. Um, I made reference to the fact that we have the sole election uh, that's going to be interesting to watch with former Prime Minister uh, Lee nak uh representing the ruling party and for United Future, uh, uh, Huang kyo uh, also uh, kind of the two dominant figures and they may well be the matchup in 2022. So we'll see how it plays out. But I think that uh, the basic bottom line that it's a read on where the government is by way of response to coronavirus seems accurate. Uh, and whereas earlier concerns about scandals about domestic economic priorities uh, and some of the agenda there, uh, the concern about uh, jobs, et cetera, and uh, referenda via the engagement with North Korea, all have kind of fallen by the wayside. Those will reemerge, no doubt, in the post-election reality. Uh, but it seems at this point to be about the response to the public health crisis. And uh, it looks in the early indicators, but remember it's just the opening of, of early voting and the main uh, game will take place on Wednesday. Uh, what is impressive uh, as you stand back and look at it is that you have 44 million eligible voters who will uh, have the opportunity to participate in this. That's an enormous number. And, and for Korea to push ahead and have it at this time, uh, when lots of others and lots of other places have canceled, or, or whether, as Josh mentioned, uh, with Wisconsin, and as Che sung Hun mentions in his piece today for the New York Times, uh, there were a lot of complications. Uh, everything seems to be going uh, in, in a rather uh, coordinated, very positive manner with South Korea. Uh, when one goes into the poll to vote, uh, there's healthy social distancing uh, between voters, uh, people don gloves. Uh, there's uh, hand sanitizers, there's, you know, contact in terms of voting, scrubbing, cleaning after. And again, if the temperatures that are taken of those voting uh, are above the 97.5 level, they're ushered into a separate area and then taken for testing. So it's a very uh, well coordinated uh, a very aggressive way to do it in, in, when I say aggressive, in a very positive manner. So let's see how it plays out, but that's a huge level of participation and it's quite impressive uh, to, to see at this time. They've managed to pull this off despite the very, very heady challenge of coronavirus. Great, thank you, Stephen. Um, next question we have is uh, from Emma Chandler Avery from the Congressional Research Service. <laughs> And she Hi, asked, <laughs> <laughs> broadly speaking, the U.S. has intensified its hard line against Beijing in reaction to the coronavirus. Japan appeared to be working on strengthening its ties with China as it prepared for the now canceled Xi Jinping state visit. Do you see a tension developing between Japan looking to stabilize relations with China as the United States increasingly views China as a strategic competitor? 
Thank you, Emma. Nice, succinct question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it a I'll give it a very short answer, but we can certainly talk at length um, another time. So I I do sense that at the at this particular moment, the the there's a lot of talk in Washington, as you know, about Japan getting too close to China or Japan compromising too much in the in the document that was getting was being drafted for the Xi state visit. So at the micro level, I think there's a lot of tension. There was a lot of attention being paid before COVID-19 arrived to shake us all up to just how much compromise would be in the Japanese position towards China. I, I think today, so structurally, we are in a, a time for Japan that Overcompromise with China is just not conceivable, uh, given the strategic balance of power between the two of them. This is not a moment in Tokyo where there's going to be uh, a whole lot of letting down the guard as to Chinese military intentions. Um, but as I noted when we were talking about COVID-19, I think that the reality is that the Japanese economy is deeply interdependent with China and was not, it, disengagement is not an easy thing and neither side wants it. I think COVID-19 may accelerate some of that disengagement, but by a, a result of that could be a far greater intensification of tension between Beijing and Tokyo, which I think neither side would like to see. So I think all bets are off for a moment until we see how we come out of this COVID-19, but I don't suspect that Japan is going to cozy up to China uh, in a way that would be uh, deleterious to US interests. If I could add a word on the Korea-China relationship. Uh, it's been interesting because President Moon Jae-in uh, did make a, a critical phone call in March to Xi Jinping to uh, express uh, the desire for cooperation and, and coordination across the public health sector. He was very cautious in doing that. Korea has, has walked a, a careful line in terms of that. And Xi Jinping has since called back and offered condolences uh, to the people of Korea on coronavirus. Uh, but what Korea doesn't want uh, is to be back in any more dangerous economic situation relative to what happened after the TAD deployment, the anti-missile system deployment, uh, where Korea took a real hit on the nose uh, when it came to travel, tourism, and investment. Uh, they've just gotten out of that, and there has been this rapprochement with China that it would like to see going forward. So it will continue to try to build on that momentum uh, and to try to create a common public health response, but also given the supply chain realities, et cetera, uh, try to have an established return to normalcy. Okay, great. Um, our next question uh, comes from two different uh, question askers, audience members, who are interested in Korea-Japan relations. So this is a good one for everybody to tackle. Uh, and they're curious about are we seeing any specific improvements or degradation of political cooperation between Korea and Japan? Um, and, and so perhaps we could look at how the trajectory of Korea-Japan relations prior to the coronavirus pandemic has, has been affected uh, by it. So I can take a, a quick stab. I, I, I'm not sure I have a good answer to that question. It's a great question. Um, I. Uh, you know, we were coming into the this year looking at the Japan ROK relationship with a couple of expectations or hopes, I should say. Expectation may be the wrong word. Hopes, right? And that is that the diplomacy that was going on in December, um, the discussions over the export restrictions that had been so bad for the Korean um, manufacturers, semiconductor um, and computer manufacturers, right? High tech industry would be lessened, right? And that the two countries would have a better understanding of how to impose and how they were each imposing export restrictions for the sanction, sanctioning of North Korea. There was you know, some hope that Abe and Moon would have a good summit when the trilateral Japan are okay um, PRC uh, meeting happened. Didn't quite end up that as, as positive as I think some of us were hoping, wasn't bad wasn't great. Um, but the real question, of course, coming into 2020 was the status of the Supreme Court decisions uh, on the forced labor cases. And I think lots of people were holding their breath about that. But so there was a lot of undone business coming into, into January. Uh, on top of the, the COVID-19 hasn't swept any of this away. 
nor has it made it less important. I was a little concerned when Japan announced it was restricting travelers from Japan and South Korea, that, that Seoul seemed to take offense at that um, and reacted. But I think that was a little tiny blip. It wasn't evidence in my mind to deeper antagonisms affecting their ability to cooperate in COVID-19. I still think we have a difficult relationship. Elections are coming political leaders will be sensitive, um, but I'm hoping that some opportunity of opening the gates for COVID-19 cooperation or broader regional cooperation might help soothe some of the more tender aspects of the relationship. Sheila has said it very eloquently. I think if I just add a footnote, it's that if you take a, a look back, what has pushed Korea and Japan closer together uh, have been in times of difficulty uh, for example, a security threat, primarily in this case, North Korea. Uh, things like 1998 Asia financial crisis, 2008 global financial crisis. Uh, we had measures on both sides. 311 was invoked. And uh, as I recall, Korea uh, had the first foreign uh, boots on the ground, as it were, in terms of humanitarian assistance in trying to show uh, uh, sympathies and extend assistance in Japan. Uh, so you have some potential here for, for coronavirus response to, to push them closer together. Uh, but that doesn't uh, by any means uh, uh, undermine the, the more dominant argument that, that she was making, which is that we still have a lot on the board uh, that is unresolved and will be very difficult to get past. Uh, but let's hope that there is a push factor here uh, that sees Tokyo and Seoul recognizing that to get out of economic morass, to create a revitalized set of economies, you need to be working together and uh, guiding forward the region. Okay, so our next question comes from Terence, War Terence Rorig, uh, our friend from the Naval War College, and he wants to know what is actually happening in North Korea with COVID-19? Uh, well, actually, the, the situation as it stands now in terms of North Korea's reporting to WHO is that it has zero cases. However, they, they claim in the, the latest statements to have 500 uh, people under quarantine. That's after a much larger quarantine exercise that involved both citizens as well as foreign nationals resident there. Uh, but most experts surmise that it can't possibly be the case, although they clearly as a totalitarian uh, regime were able to pull down uh, the, the, the curtains or the blinders as it were, uh, trade uh, across uh, between China and, and North Korea pretty much uh, stopped for a long period of time and seems to have only just reopened uh, in Dandong and across the bridge there. Uh, there has been mention of, of potential aid supplies to come in. Uh, though that then begs the question of whether or not North Korea is, is seeking assistance. Uh, we do know from some reporting in the Financial Times and otherwise that North Korea has very quietly uh, come out and asked for international support by way of testing kits, uh, surgical gowns and other supplies. I reference the fact that they don't have much of a health infrastructure. And what we have to be very concerned about is with the lack of that infrastructure, uh, pandemic there could have very significant effect not only for the peoples of North Korea, uh, but really have effect outward to, to China, uh, to South Korea, and, and to Japan, especially if it was to devolve into a refugee type situation. Uh, so trying to stem the health crisis there uh, may be a new priority in the months going forward. Uh, but part of that too will depend on their opening up and their transparency uh, with the WHO and with the international community. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, this next one's for Sheila. It comes from Kelly Ahn. Uh, she's a doctor from Atlanta, Georgia. And she asks, what timing did the time, what impact did the timing of the Olympics postponement decision have on Japan's delay in handling the COVID pandemic? Hi, Kelly, thank you. It's, um, or Dr. Ahn. Um, it's a great question and I wish I could give you a really good informed answer. I think that the, the suspicion was that the Abe cabinet delayed a, a full on public health response and because of the Olympics. Now, I think that's a suspicion. Um, I'm not sure it 
bears out, um, but I don't have access to the higher task force discussions and, and other discussions. I think it's fair to say that the Abe cabinet, like every other government that's had to confront COVID-19, has been trying to balance economic impact with the public health, the, the need for more stringent public health responses. I think there's a misperception though in the, in the, um, in the observations of Japan that their medical community did not lead the conversation on how to respond. And that's just not true. From very early on, it was the medical, the NII, which is the equivalent of the um, uh, Dr. Fauci's group at CDC, right? Um, they were the first ones to be consulted. So the cluster strategy was really informed by medical expertise, not by any political calculation about the Olympics. But there is a suspicion, of course, that the economic fallout from cancellation first and foremost or now postponement would be would be severe and I think that's what the Abe cabinet was trying to preclude was a full-on cancellation so there was a lot of complex negotiations behind the scenes on that but I don't think it intervened or it it made the Japanese government falter but I think we're going to have to wait to the you know the commission reports on COVID-19 response until we get that kind of depth to be able to really adequately answer your question. Hey, thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Alexis Dutton, who's a professor of history at the University of Connecticut. And this question is about your pedagogical approach. So both of you are both valued policy advisors and scholars. With your professor hats on for a moment, it seems unlikely that we will be in the physical space of a classroom anytime soon. There's a different kind of engaged debate one sustains online. And I would like to hear how you both suggest teaching japan Korea relations in this context. For example, what sorts of materials would you use to move the conversation forward? Hello, Alexis, Professor Dutton, nice to, nice to get a question from you. I'll jump in real quick. I'm teaching a class uh, which may not be able to answer your question. So the class I have this semester is actually Japanese domestic politics. So I am, uh, we, we had a session last week on uh, historical memory uh, and Japanese in, in, the, in the domestic political context of Japan, um, in which we talked a lot about uh, legacy issues, but not directly um, the kind of how do we deal with the dynamic between South Korea and Japan. We talked about some of the issues and how they were organized politically in Japan. Um, I, I think, you know, I have a course in the fall on Asia's nationalisms, and I think that will be the one that's more challenging for me. Um, what I have are two seminar style approaches rather than a lecture class, so that may also affect my answer to you. I have a lot of student engagement in terms of presentation on topics. So the students themselves, I teach at Georgetown, by the way, for those of you who don't know, I'm an adjunct there. So um, a lot of our students are from China, from South Korea, from Japan, and in addition to being from the United States. And so um, I have a pretty healthy dose of student participation and guidance of the presentations when I teach the nationalism class. Um, but let me turn it over to Steve because he, he may have more. Sure. Sure. And I, I, I have right. something of the reverse of your, your teaching responsibility. In the fall, I'll be doing my domestic class for political yeah. science at, at Columbia. But uh, the spring course, uh, that we have is a new one on Korea and regional relations, which is taught at Columbia SEPA. And so since it's uh, kickoff on the 22nd of January, uh, weekly we have been talking about coronavirus and at times it's dominated uh, half the class in terms of responses across uh, from China when, uh, you know, that was how we first discussed it. The first two or three classes was about what was happening in Wuhan, what was taking place in terms of uh, Beijing's uh, uh, response and then where the Koreans were by way of their uh, cautions and, and their policy. And, uh, and then we were looking at the other players in the region and how they were dealing with it. It's since then blossomed out to really the full uh, blown South Korean response and what it was doing uh, in terms of its application of testing and, and tracing and social distancing and uh, what the implications were regionally, what it, they were uh, globally in terms of offering support and lessons learned and uh, where it has gone now uh, by way of regional relations. So uh, we finish up with that class at the end of April. One of the things that's happened that's been interesting is a number of our students uh, from uh, China and uh, from Japan uh, and from Korea have gone back uh, to those places. So as they join for Zoom sessions and our weekly class, we're actually getting on the ground reads, um, mm. uh, which are interesting. It adds a different dimension uh, 
Uh, but I know it's a challenge for all of us uh, uh, teaching, uh, you know, at all levels to try to find out what this new medium uh, can do most effectively. Uh, but one of the things I have found then is the, the sort of the real-time reporting. And uh, it's a tough time. I mean, it's a tough time for everyone. So to keep yeah. the eyes focused on public policy uh, has been a challenge. We all know it's important. Uh, but uh, uh, it's, I think, evolving and our answers may be more developed uh, if we talk about that uh, in, in the fall. I am very impressed, I must say, with uh, the line that the university administration has taken and the Columbia president has taken. Uh, very brave and active responses. They're very much involved here in New York with the response, with the support for, for the field hospitals, transitioning dormitories into places uh, for residents, for healthcare workers. Uh, being very cautious with the community, sensitive to student needs, and a transition of the system to a pass-fail grading uh, just to take pressure off students at this time. But it's an active debate. No doubt it will be a defining aspect as we talk about Asia-U.S. relations going forward, I'm certain, for the remainder of this decade. Okay, just uh, two more quick questions because I know that we're running out of time here. Um, Unsun Cho, a graduate student at Yale University, asks a question that's very related to what Joshua was discussing before about nationalism. She says, many people think that this pandemic may turn the tide against globalization. How should Japan and South Korea respond? Something we talked about earlier, but if you have any uh, expanding thoughts there. I, I kind of said my piece a little earlier, but I'll, I'll just repeat it. Um, I, I think my design, my hope would be, the aspiration for me would be that, that Japan and South Korea actually see this as an opportunity to be out in front of that conversation, to demonstrate not only their best practices nationally, but how they can, they can and did work with others globally during the crisis. And I think it's a, it's, it's, in this moment, I think in our, our, our global relationships, I think it is a particularly difficult time for those who advocate for global cooperation um, to have the sustaining winds of that global cooperation actually helping their case at home. And I think this is a, a prime example of where global cooperation is, is obviously the better choice and demonstrably, right, um, the better outcome going forward. So I think Japan and South Korea have an opportunity here and I, I hope they see it that way. I'm not sure that there's anything more specific I can offer at this particular moment, but I am, again, to reiterate what I said earlier, particularly impressed with the medical community and the role that they've played uh, in not only advocating for global cooperation, but actually actively seeking it. So I hope we can, we can take heart from that. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Sean King at Park Strategies. He says that the U.S. media has generally handled South Korea's COVID approach as a success. How is Japanese media treating South Korea's COVID response? And, and I guess that we, we could widen that out a little bit as well. Just generally, what's the interplay of the media here in the coronavirus response? Hmm, interesting. That's, a, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure. Maybe Joshua can help me with this one. I, I don't see in the Japanese media... Um, a, a, a big focus on certainly not on South Korea as you know picking on South Korea or anything like that. I think there's been um, an open discussion of other countries' experiences and that includes the best practices and the success of South Korea along with Singapore, Taiwan. Um, so you see much what you see in the global press, but I think the, 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 the Japanese conversation has largely been very domestically focused. Um, one, one person I, who has become sort of this voice of criticism uh, of both Prime Minister Abe and Governor Koike is uh, former governor of Tokyo, Matsuzoe, who was also a former health uh, and welfare minister in, in an LDP cabinet. So he's very knowledgeable on these issues. And, and um, he is also uh, watching Europe, watching North America, watching us, the United States, right? And commenting an awful lot about um, Abe, the prime minister's response being too slow, 
the, the governor's response being too slow. And so he's a big prod in, on Twitter, on the press. Um, and so he's, he's had a very active voice. And so he does a lot of comparisons and he praises South Korea, Taiwan and Singapore, the three cases who, where there's been significant mitigation and containment. So I, I don't see it as a big debating point inside uh, the Japanese media at the moment. I think there's there's very myopically focused on the, what happened this week, the stimulus and the national emergency law at home. I'll give Stephen the last word and then I'll, I'll wrap us up because as, as a good Japanese, we're seven minutes over, which you know we're all gonna have to pay penance for that. So let me give Stephen <laughs> the last word and then I'll wrap it up for us. No, I, I, th I think you've done a marvelous job. And, and Josh, I like your, your optimism and positive lean on it. And, and Sheila, you know, I think that was a very eloquent answer on, on globalization and the hope for cooperation. Uh, so we are looking for best practices. And I think uh, the momentum around Northeast Asia, where the first, second, third, and 10th largest economies of the world converge, uh, mean that that dynamism may converge in new and interesting, let's hope exciting ways to try to address this uh, deadly, deadly virus. Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining. I thought, you know, if you judge a event by the type of questions that we got, I think this is a huge success. Sheila and Stephen, you have been great in terms of kind of unpacking this. Uh, hopefully we don't have to keep on doing this for too much longer, but while we do, uh, I think we need to go on the road with this. This was a great conversation with you all. Thank you <laughs> thank for you. being able to go back and forth and kind of always giving us something to look forward to. If this pandemic has taught us anything, it's that we're interconnected and that we do have to work on this together. And we can't simply leave this to someone else uh, because surely it will find us. It doesn't know nationalism. Uh, it doesn't know nations. It really only knows uh, human to human contact. And even as we have to physically distance, being able to be connected with so many friends and the questions you guys all ask, I just want to thank you guys again for joining us. And hopefully this will not be uh, the last of the conversation, but simply the beginning, particularly as the Korea Society and Japan Society engage in the way we've already demonstrated. I hope this is the beginning of something much larger and we can look back to this moment as the beginning of something even better. So thank you, thank you Sheila, Stephen, thank you all of you for joining us today. Thank you. My pleasure and thank you both to the Japan Society and the Korea Society. I'm delighted to see the cooperation and always happy to be with Steve and Joshua with you. And so congratulations on a wonderful program. Thank you again. I'll give you guys a virtual high five and also some elbow bumping <laughs> at the same time. All right. Thank you I'll again. Have a great afternoon. Have a good one. Bye, everybody. Bye.